Uh, lovely to see so many new faces. Uh, it means that the message is getting out there. Um, this, uh, for me, is it's such a boost to have a gathering of this size. Uh, it shows that, uh, that the movement is growing. I want to explain to you about the kind of structure that we're trying to establish, just so you know what you're buying into. Um, we're trying to establish here in Ireland our version, the Irish version of the Swedish model. Uh, I was diagnosed with this disease when I was in Belgium in 1994, that's 22 years ago. And one of the things that you discover along the way is that sometimes people fall between the cracks unnecessarily. People die unnecessarily. People get the wrong treatments unnecessarily simply because this can be a really difficult disease to diagnose. And then even when it's diagnosed properly, uh, it can be a difficult disease to treat unless people know what they're doing. And in a way, it's kind of counterintuitive because the, the, the things you hear about cancer is, oh, did he get the all clear or did she get the all clear? With us, you rarely can apply that. You have this thing for life, really. It's a chronic disease. Uh, and the second thing you, you, you sometimes hear is, oh, they have cancer of the liver. And once you hear that, they say, oh, they're finished. People sort of begin to look at you. You can see them pulling back because they think that's the end of you. Well, I've had 20 or 30 tumors on my liver for, for 20 years. So you're not finished. And then the worst form of cancer you can hear a person having is pancreatic cancer. If it's pancreatic cancer, it's a dirty, relentless, painful cancer that ends only in one way. But you have people who have a neuroendocrine primary on the cancer, uh, on, the, on the pancreas, and those people can live and survive for a very long time. Um, so the disease you have, a lot of the language that's out there and a lot of the understanding that's out there, you have to throw that to one side and you have to start looking at it in a, in a completely different way. So when I say uh, we're trying to build uh, an Irish version of the Swedish model, what we're attempting to do uh, as a cooperative, it's almost like the old Irish concept of a mehel, is we have established the notion that there should be a center of excellence with satellites. The center of excellence is St. Vincent's Hospital. The national lead for it is uh, Dermot O'Toole. Uh, and he works with colleagues who are experts in their field, whether it's a surgeon uh, like Justin, or an endocrinologist like Donal O'Shea, or an oncologist or a radiologist in Vincent's or indeed in the other hospitals who understand our disease. There are satellite centers. There's a very good team in Cork who have an association with us, the likes of Krista or Suluan, um, uh, and Derek, who's an oncologist, really, really good guy. And there are people in Waterford who are switched on to this disease, and there are people in Galway who are switched on to this disease. But for anybody who has our condition, our advice is, as a patient's group, is try to get switched in to that national center of excellence that is based in St. Vincent's, because that gives you the best chance of survival. We have the national lead there. And the person you saw sitting at the top table, just so you understand where the, the, the different roles people have, that's Lisa. Uh, Lisa Collin is like the nurse manager coordinator. She's the person who deals with the throughput of patients like you as the information is being built up. And the hope is the kind of care you're going to get there is standardized. So there'll be the same level of expertise exercised for you that the same level of thought will go in across the layers of uh, consultants. Uh, so you'll have maybe the physician's view, you'll have the endocrinologist's view, you'll have all those people giving their input, their level of expertise. So the level of knowledge is built up. So we try and get rid of the danger of people 
slipping bit between the cracks unnecessarily. Next thing that's important for you to know, it doesn't stop in Ireland. We have the most fantastic contacts with the HSE, with the NCCP, and with uh, centres of excellence elsewhere, where there are procedures available that are not yet on offer in Ireland. Most important place for a lot of us is Uppsala in Sweden. That's where I had a lot of the important surgery carried out that has kept me alive. That's why Per Hellman is here. Per is a professor of surgery in Sweden, uh, and in the year 2000, he carried out surgery on me that wasn't available in Belgium at the time, wasn't available in Ireland, and it's because of Per that I'm still alive. You've heard uh, Dermot referring to lutetium treatment. Lutetium treatment isn't yet available in Ireland. Uh, sometimes patients from Ireland are sent to Rotterdam, sometimes they're sent to Uppsala. Lutetium treatment involves taking a radioactive isotope that comes from a nuclear plant, I think, in, in Holland. Uh, and there are lots of people in this room who've had lutetium treatment. You can have maybe four, five, six belts of lutetium. Um, and you're given that treatment, you're monitored for it, and you're given it as long as it's effective and up to the stage where it starts to have very, very negative effects on your kidneys. There are other treatments available in, in foreign centers as well. And the wonderful thing about this cooperative that we are building brick by brick, patient by patient, month by month, year by year. The wonderful thing about it is the HSE and the group of consultants you have here and the NCCP will sign you off for access to that treatment in a foreign center if it is not available here. It's just magic. It just means hope doesn't end here. Uh, and sometimes it stutters, but most of the time it happens in a pretty seamless way. It happens fast. Happens faster, I'd say, than for most cancer groups uh, in this country. And that's because of the level of cooperation uh, and kinship and friendship that we have established with these organizations. It's very, very uplifting that that facility is available. So it's really important for you as a patient or as a family member of a patient uh, to know that that uh, option so exists. Now can I just talk about, about you and about what it's like to be a, a patient uh, with this disease? Uh, for me, it was uh, fascinating to hear Justin talk about uh, survivors and to have that reference uh, to Lance Armstrong. Because in some respects, I'm on Lance Armstrong's wavelength. Uh, I consider myself to be in the category of uh, nearly drowned as opposed to nearly saved. Um, when I was diagnosed in uh, 1994, uh, my daughter Moya was nine months old, and she's now 23. And it's just so uplifting to know that I've been around for her. Uh, and I put that down to the kind of expertise I have received from this fella here on my right, Per, and from these characters here. It is such, um, such an uplifting experience to have their friendship and their expertise. And we really have to, as human beings, be conscious of what they're doing for us. Um, he tells, he, he, actually it's a mistruth uh, when Donald O'Shea says that I was badgering him. He actually came to me. He was aware that I was unhappy about the way people were dying needlessly. And he came to me and said he would like to try and do something about it. Justin is such an understated man in the way he addresses you. But when he goes in to that, when he's scrubbed up, and when he goes in to open you up and to try and remove the cancers from you, he is just so, so committed to trying to keep you alive. He cares for you so much. 
the guy who's our national lead, he was working in France. He has a French wife. And to woo him back, to get him committed to coming to lead this team, that took some persuasion because he wants to be as effective as he can for as long as he has in his role. And to get him to, you know, to come across, it was almost like getting somebody to defect, you know, the politics that goes on in medicine between UCD, TCD, St. Vincent, St. James's, to get, to get the, the system in place that we managed to get a Dermot to come and lead this. It's just such a magic thing to see that happening. And to have as well in place someone from the NCCP, overall charge of the allocation of resources, to have him coming in here on a Saturday morning and sitting discreetly at the back of the room, listening to us, taking feedback from the question and answer sessions. That for me, as a patient, it's just so, so affirming, it's energizing, and it just makes me feel that we're doing something meaningful uh, with our lives. And we have that very same relationship with Catherine, who runs the uh, Treatment Abroad Scheme in the HSE. She is just so, so open to our requests when we're looking to get things done. When I say um, I feel uh, lucky, I feel like Lance Armstrong, uh, the reason why is this. Um, if you were to, to get a cancer, um, this is probably um, as good as it gets in terms of cancers because for a lot of us, um, you can live with this disease for quite a long time. Uh, I'm proof of that. I'm your show pony. It doesn't always work out like that. We were in this very room, or in a room like this, but at this meeting last year, and a girl came to us asking about her sister. Her sister was from Venezuela. She was in our house um, at Easter in Sligo. She had come to Germany for treatment, and she died two months later. And had that girl been born in Ireland, been born within the European Union, she would, I'd say, have several more years of life. Being a citizen of the European Union uh, is it's such a gift for us because we can access these services. And sometimes people are just unlucky uh, with this disease. Sometimes the disease is more aggressive than in others. There are people in this room maybe who have a more aggressive disease than me. But uh, I say that in my case, I consider myself lucky. The reason I consider myself lucky, and I'm going to end on this, um, the reason I consider myself lucky is, first of all, I have come to understand, uh, and I had no choice about this, I've come to understand that we all die sometime. Uh, no one has yet devised a formula to get out of this place alive. Um, I have come to understand that, you know, uh, our, the, the, our number is written in a book maybe somewhere, but we all die at some stage. Um, and because I have that knowledge, uh, it's almost empowering. Um, you get things put into perspective. You get a perspective uh, in um, that uh, it's going to end sometime, and you have an opportunity to do something with your life. I'm so conscious of those in the room who don't have this disease, but who have a family member with it. And I feel a huge sense of responsibility to them because they, in their situation, worry so much about us. And they feel pretty helpless about us. And they're watching our mood. They're wondering, how are we? They're wondering, are we in pain? They're wondering, is there anything they can be doing? They're wondering, are we going to die? They're wondering, what is it going to be like without us? They're wondering, how are they going to cope? And um, I really think that we have, in our lives, because we have this awareness, we have a chance to love them in a more meaningful way. We really have a chance to, um, first of all, 
create something in this structure that we're belonging to, to make it stronger for the next generation of carcinoid patients, of NETS patients. But we also have a chance to give those we love a sense that we weren't afraid, that we did the best we could, that we confronted this, that we made a contribution maybe to making it better for the next generation of NETS patients. Last night, I was in Sligo. I was comparing a concert involving the High Hopes Choir. These are homeless people, people who through no fault of their own have slipped between the cracks. And to see them there last night, and you could see the scars of life, the physical scars of life on a lot of these people. But they were standing there on the stage, 60 of them. Some of them had traveled from Cork, some of them had traveled from Waterford, a lot of them were from Dublin. And in front of seven or eight or 900 people, they performed to the best of their ability. They sang with such gusto and such spirit. And today, a lot of those people are back in hostels, living that tough life of a hostel resident. And I took from that night last night that this is our High Hopes Choir. We are the High Hopes Choir of NETS patients. We have this chance to do the best we can, to sing with gusto, to improve the structure for the next generation of NETS patients. But most importantly, to give hope to those around us who love us. And the last, last point I want to make is I want to thank our partners in this enterprise, the NCCP, the HSE, the pharmaceutical companies who provide the products and who provide the sponsorship for an occasion like this. But most importantly, these people who are driving the structures, the creation of the structures um, that we depend on. Because they, in their lives, it's not just rugby matches, but they actually, they have colleagues who get cancer, who suffer heart attacks, they lost colleagues in the course of the past 12 months since we were here. They lost colleagues to illness. And sometimes it seems almost perverse that people who give their lives to trying to treat illness, that they should be part of a cather who suffer the same kinds of diseases. But that's the reality they face too. So on that note, thank you for coming here today. And during the question and answer session, and in the informal sessions we have among ourselves, when you're having a cup of coffee or you have a lunch, whatever fear you have, whatever worry you have, whatever query you have, whatever complaint you have, please, please, don't take it out the door with you. Please, please raise it, uh, and we'll try and process it. Thank you.